Welcome everyone to Ecology Live. I'm Jonathan Wood, Head of Society Programmes at the British Ecological Society. Thanks for joining us today. And wherever you are in the world, whether you're joining us live on Zoom or watching at a later time on YouTube, we hope you're staying safe and well. Now, this is our ninth talk in the Ecology Live series. It's also the last one taking place at 3 p.m. UK time. From next week, Thursday, the 6th of May, Ecology Live will be at the new time of 9 a.m. That's 4 p.m. in Beijing and 6 p.m. in Sydney. And it's, it's because we really hope that some of our friends in those parts of the world will be able to join us for the final three talks in this Ecology Live series. So if you're an Ecology Live regular, please make a note in your calendars. And I suppose if the new time is in the middle of the night for you, you can still, of course, watch the recording on our YouTube channel. We thank Oxford University Press for sponsoring this whole season of Ecology Live. Um, they've put together a reading list, especially for Ecology Live viewers, uh, and you can find details of that, including exclusive discounts on the slide at the end of the talk. So do make sure you stay on to find out more. Thanks too to Wildlife Acoustics for providing the wonderful soundscape that started this session. Um, just before I introduce today's speaker, uh, some quick housekeeping notes. The talk is being recorded and will be added to YouTube afterwards. If you're here in real time on Zoom, you can use the Q&A box uh, to submit your questions throughout the talk. Um, there's no need to wait until the very end. Do submit the questions as soon as you have them. And you can um, put your name there or you can make them an uh, anonymous. You decide. You'll also be able to see in that box all the questions that other people are submitting. So you can uh, give a thumbs up, upvote any of uh, people's questions that you find particularly interesting. We'll see just how many of those questions we can get through at the end of the talk. Uh, we also have live captioning available. Uh, these may have come on automatically for you, but uh, you can toggle the subtitles on and off by clicking the, the button in the toolbar. Uh, I think it says CC uh, at the bottom of the Zoom window. But now, without further ado, it's time to introduce today's speaker, Maria Donalath from the University of St Andrews in Scotland, where she's direct, uh, Deputy Director of the Centre for Biological Diversity. Her research interests lie in biodiversity, macroecology and corals, particularly in quantifying biodiversity and understanding the processes that shape it. Maria's first degree was at the University of Lisbon in Portugal, and she did her PhD at James Cook University in Australia. She's a member of the Young Academy of Scotland and a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. Now, on Maria's web pages, she says that she is more question driven than organism driven. And that's perhaps where today's talk title and its intriguing question comes from and why we're all so interested to hear more. So um, to answer that question, is biodiversity declining? I hand over to Maria. Um, thank you very much, um, John, for a great introduction. I will start sharing my slides. And um, okay, so here we go. So um, thank you very much for the invitation to be here. Ecology Life is a really wonderful resource and I feel honored <clears throat> to contribute to it. Um, so as John mentioned, the title of my talk is um, a Biodiversity Declining. And uh, maybe you're thinking, well, of course it is, um, which would make this a very short talk. Um, but actually I hope to persuade you that um, the answer to this question is, uh, complex and nuanced um, and then the and that the honest answer really is that it depends okay but aren't we in the middle of the sixth um, mass extinction and um, haven't we be, been warned that um, a million species are at risk of, a, of extinction and this is um, the headline of um, the IPBS global assessment which was published last year um, the largest biodiversity assessment um, um, yet involving hundreds of scientists and tens of thousands of um, scientific um, papers. I am um, not disputing either of these claims, 
but they're both about global biodiversity um, change. And um, my talk today, um, in my talk today, I hope to um, convince you that actually biodiversity change um, depends on a number of things. Um, it depends on spatial skill. Um, it varies in, in ge geographic space. Um, um, it depends on different drivers of change which act with different intensities in, in different parts of the planet. And also that all of this variation matters. Okay, so um, uh, behind my talk, uh, behind the science that I'm going to present this uh, uh, here today um, is the Biotime uh, database, a public database of biodiversity time series, um, which is the collective work of um, around 300 um, um, biodiversity scientists um, listed here, and they're co-authors of the data paper that made it public. Um, the database is a living resource, it's still growing, it currently includes um, nearly 13 million records um, from nearly um, uh, 700,000 locations, nearly 50,000 species um, from across 443 studies. And because these are time series, um, they spread in time from the late 1800s um, to the present, although uh, the vast majority of the data are from the past 50 to 40 years. Now, the first um, study uh, that we published, which um, analyzed the biotime data, um, was done at a time when the database was about a fourth of its current size. Um, and what we did at the time was fit uh, a, um, um, a hierarchical um, model um, to uh, biodiversity or well, species visions change on the y axis here um, as a function of time across the 100 uh, data sets that made up the database um, at the time. And what we found was that contrary to our expectation, we see um, uh, lots of um, gains and lots of losses. And these gains and losses are balanced so that um, on average, the global slope that we estimated um, is this flat line over here, indistinguishable from zero um, um, slope. Um, we also looked at compositional change. Um, and to do that, we use the Jacquard index um, at a time, which goes from zero when two samples don't have any species in common, to one when every um, species is present um, in, in the two samples that are being compared. And we looked at um, how uh, Jacquard similarity changed as we compared each time point with the start of the time series. And what we found was that similarity very much consistently changed through time, indicating that um, and decline through time, which indicating that we have changing composition, um, um, a, 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 extremely prevalent. Now, um, so we have a great deal of variation in trends here, um, but out of the 202 uh, lines that I'm showing on this slide, there's one that can, uh, was in stark contrast with what we think we know about biodiversity change, and that's the, oops, that went too fast, um, and that's the flat line on the left here. Um, and uh, what I'm going to try to um, persuade you is that to understand this apparent um, contradiction, we actually need to understand the, uh, the other 201 um, lines in this plot. So what's driving the variation um, in um, biodiversity trends um, that we see? And that's what we've been doing over the past uh, few years. Now we came up with a hypothesis that um, part of this um, uh, apparent discrepancy was related to scale. Um, um, in that there are enough species and enough organisms on the planet that declines at one scale are not necessarily, re necessarily reflected with declines um, at other scales. Um, and specifically that declines at the global scale are not necessarily detectable um, at the local scale if we have at the same time um, a spatial reorganization um, um, of species as we think we do. To use a metaphor here, we can't really predict the number of, of water droplets on a leaf by the season of the year. So we know that there's variation in both um, and, and we know that the, the two are not independent, but they're also, there's a great deal of variation, um, especially in terms of the number of drop, water droplets um, um, on a leaf. And so this is the, an argument that, and a hypothesis that we put forward in the paper uh, that Brian McGill um, led uh, back in 2015. And then um, a few years later, we set about um, testing this hypothesis um, with data. 
And this is a paper um, that came out of um, an SD working group called S Change, and this paper in particular um, was led by um, John Chase. So what we did here uh, was combine um, data from Biotime as well as lots of other sources, um, including uh, uh, checklist data, to look at how um, biodiversity change uh, varies across spatial scales. And we used the log ratio of species richness um, between the start and the end of our time series, which is negative when we have declines and positive when we have increases. And we looked at how this uh, log ratio um, changes with spatial scale across scales that go from like the size of a flower bed um, to um, entire continents. It turns out this is actually a very difficult question to, um, to tackle because we use different methods to study biodiversity um, at different scales. So if we focus, like if we control for um, um, method of study, it becomes very difficult to detect any effect um, of scale. But there are definitely um, signs or signals that um, um, that change um, uh, in biodiversity uh, depends um, on scale. Um, this is an example um, that is focused on uh, terrestrial plants. Um, and here, um, I hope you see, as I see, that the variance um, in trends is much higher at local scales and it kind of decreases as we increase um, spatial scale. Somewhat reassuringly for me, um, we, have, we also find um, a, a balance of, of, well, we find increases and decreases um, in, 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 in other data. So it's not just a feature of, of biotime data that, um, that has this balance of increases and, and decreases, we find increases and decreases in other types of data um, as well. Now, um, uh, the next topic that I want to talk about uh, deals uh, with um, spatial uh, variation, geographical variation in trends um, in, um, um, in biodiversity. And we, the, we hypothesize that some of the local scale variation that we saw in the previous um, um, slide uh, might um, might be um, you know spatially organized. There might be some spatial signals in terms um, um, underpinning that um, that variation. And this is work again another um, output of the S change working group, and it was work that was led by Shane Gloves um, and um, and Sarah Sapp. Um, so we by this time had tripled the size um, of the database. Uh, we uh, controlled uh, for um, spatial scale. We used different models. So now we were using um, uh, Bayesian models uh, instead. Um, and yet um, at the global scale, we find a very similar pattern um, in that um, the global uh, trend is ind indistinguishable from zero. That's what we're representing here uh, with the um, uh, the black dot and the confidence intervals um, around it. And in the figure more broadly, we have color coded uh, the marine biomes um, of the world um, uh, in blue. If the, the trends there are above the global mean and in the warm color, so red and pink, um, when they're below uh, the global mean. And when I, what I see when I look um, um, at this figure is that most of the red um, is towards the center of the map, so towards the tropics, and, and most of the temperate and, and the polar regions are color-coded um, in blue. And we kind of hypothesize that this might be a, a signal of uh, polewards uh, migrations uh, of range expansions of, of, of species in response to, um, to climate change. So this is the marine realms. Um, the, the figure for the terrestrial realm um, um, is, is less other less obvious uh, patterns. Um, I don't necessarily see clear patterns here. I have presented this figure um, in the past to people who see maybe potentially a signal of the density of human um, uh, populations. Um, uh, uh, again, we saw uh, the most striking change um, uh, 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 is visible in terms of compositional change. Um, we're now measuring it with a turnover rather than a jacquard similarity. Um, and so what we see um, at the global scale are, are increases in turnover rather than decreases in, in similarity, but these are just mirror images of, of, of one another. Um, but even despite this um, ubiquitous um, uh, um, a, a change in composition, we also see um, spatial patterns be, uh, beyond that. 
Um, and the most, like the clearest um, special pattern that we see um, is that uh, is the difference between the marine and the terrestrial realm in that most of the terrestrial um, uh, biomes are uh, painted in blue, so above the global mean, and most of the terrestrial biomes are painted in red, um, uh, therefore uh, below the global mean. So this tells us that um, uh, compositional change is happening faster um, at sea uh, than on land. Now, um, so far I've been talking about uh, um, uh, local uh, change um, in biodiversity, but across the entire uh, planet. Uh, what I want to do next is just zoom into one particular example so we can look under the hood um, and, and, and in a little bit of, of, of more detail um, look at uh, one of the data sets that's behind these big sort of broad stroke uh, patterns that we see um, here. And I've chosen and like the one that like one one data set that I contributed to the BioTime um, uh, database. Um, it was collected at Lizard Island, which is on the top here. And just for your reference, this is Sydney here um, on the bottom. And I've, so I've been working uh, at uh, Lizard Island for like almost 20 years and um, specifically this is Trimodal Reef. It was um, a study site um, um, in my PhD uh, and I've just kept working there because it's a wonderful, wonderful place. Um, and the past few years we have uh, 3D uh, mapping um, the reef and um, if I zoom in further you can start to see the types of um, structures. So the, here depth is color coded um, from uh, blue to um, to yellow, and you can start to see the kinds of structures that corals um, um, built. And uh, one of the things that we've done is um, is to map the coral colonies that live here to map their locations. Um, uh, and this is data from back in 2014, um, at a time uh, where we counted um, about 11,000 coral colonies. Um, uh, distributed um, among 110 um, um, species. And these are, you know, in all kinds of shapes. So like over here, for example, on the right, we can see um, um, table corals. There's uh, boulder corals that we call massive. We have branching corals towards the top left corner. And um, all kinds of um, uh, like a highly diverse reef um, at this point in time, it has about 40% coral cover, which is the average for this uh, part of the world. Now, our field work was um, interrupted. We never finished um, our annotations um, because we were um, evacuated by a cyclone. And um, as it turns out, um, this um, the island, Lizard Island, was a hit by a sequence of um, four extreme disturbances, so two cyclones and followed by two marine um, heat waves. Um, the latter two um, having had a very drastic effects um, on, on reefs across the entire Agrippa Reef and, and, and coral reefs around the world um, more broadly. And these extreme disturbances at this site um, resulted um, in um, over 90% mortality of these corals, um, a loss of um, two thirds um, uh, of the species that we found there. And really, you know, the only things that were left were sort of small cryptic um, um, colonies and less than 2% coral cover. And I, I really, like, you know, I. I think it's struggle to call this a coral reef, quite frankly, and I have no words to describe how sad um, this uh, made me, how sad this makes me. Um, this is a part of the world that's kind of intertwined with my career and my life. And when you see it destroyed like this, it really is hard. Um, and as, as you probably know, uh, both um, cyclones and uh, marine heat waves are um, um, are connected to um, uh, climate change, um, and um, which leads me to the next topic that I want to discuss, uh, which is um, drivers of biodiversity change. Um, and this is um, another S change um, output. This one was led by um, Diana Bowler. Um, and um, here what we did uh, was to combine marine and terrestrial um, spatial layers of um, uh, 
hypothesized uh, drivers of biodiversity change. Um, so that we ended up with a map of um, cumulative um, impact um, of these layers. So cl very clearly, um, it, it, uh, some parts of the world um, have had um, have been more affected by drivers of biodiversity change um, than others. But because um, these different drivers also have a different spatial uh, distributions, it, it also turns out that different parts of the world has, have been exposed to different combinations of drivers um, of biodiversity change. And we call these, these different combinations um, anthropogenic threat um, complexes. The other interesting pattern that arises from, uh, from this analysis it um, comes from looking at um, spatial autocorrelation. So um, uh, it turns out that most layers are actually spatially autocorrelated um, and specifically with uh, the density of human population with one exception, the exception being climate change um, um, and climate change, especially particularly in the terrestrial realm um, in that the parts of the planet that have been hit the hardest by, um, by climate change um, um, often um, uh, occur uh, like for example in the arctic tundra places where we don't have a lot of um, a lot of humans leaving so um <clears throat> the next uh uh work that i want to talk about started looking at uh, the effect of one of these drivers so climate change um, on biodiversity change and this is work that was led by um laura um, and tang now, what Laura did was um, extract a temperature time series to match uh, our biodiversity time series. Um, so we focused on a subset of biotime, so time series with a minimum of five years, um, which meant that we uh, mostly had data in the temperate region. So we focused on the temperate region uh, only, um, among other things, because we actually have different hypotheses for how climate change is affecting uh, the polar and tropical regions um, it, when compared to um, its effect on temperate regions. And so this left us with uh, 21,000 um, time series. Um, and Laura extracted the temperature uh, time series that matched them um, in space and time. And then she calculated the slope. So we have, um, um, uh, you know, which are positive when the places have warmed and they're negative when the places have cooled. Um, not surprisingly, um, on average, uh, we see that both the marine in blue and the terrestrial in green um, have uh, um, um, warmed in this period. But the um, the, 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 the speed of warming um, is, is variable. So some places have warmed a lot faster than others. And, and actually some places have cooled um, in, the, in the time periods that we looked at. Um, and here are the corresponding um, species richness um, slopes. Again, um, as I mentioned before, some places have gained species, some places have lost um, species. And essentially what this work was about was matching these two distributions of slopes and figuring out whether, we, whether or not we can predict um, slopes on the bottom from the slopes um, on the top. Uh, and this is what we ended up here. So uh, let me explain how to read this plot. On the bottom here, we have um, temperature change, which is uh, positive on the right and negative um, on the left. So uh, warming places on the, rise, uh, on the right, cooling places on the left. Uh, and on a y-axis, we have long-term temperature. So places that were um, where the long-term um, mean temperature was uh, warmer on the top or colder on, on the bottom. And we color coded the, um, uh, the area behind it uh, with uh, the estimated um, uh, species which is slope, which goes from red when we have uh, species increases, species gains, to blue when we have species um, um, losses. And what we saw was that for the marine realm, um, uh, we have red on the top right corner, which tells us that um, um, uh, warm places that have warmed have on average um, gained species. Now on land, we couldn't really uh, detect um, a, a significant uh, signal. Um, and we think that the most likely reason for that um, is not that there isn't a signal, it's just that we don't have the data, we don't have enough data basically, and our data is biased in, the, in, in, its, in its distribution. Um, and if you're if you're now a little bit confused and thinking, oh, hang on, but haven't you just told gave, gave us a, like a really clear example of the horrible effects that climate change has um, on biodiversity, on coral reefs? Um, 
uh, yes, I have. Um, and but just remember that these are temperate data only. Um, and if we have um, um, range expansion expansions towards the poles, it would stand to reason that we would um, we, we would see those happening first in the warmest uh, parts of the planet, which sort of border the more tropical um, um, regions. And because of the uh, uh, latitudinal gradient of diversity, we, we would actually expect to increase a number of species um, there um, on average. So just to give you a concrete example, uh, this is a photograph uh, that um, Josh Maiden took um, in the Sydney Harbour, uh, with definitely a, a temperate place. Um, all these blobs that you see um, on the rocks here are corals, and corals didn't used to be um, there. So this is a species that is um, expanding, uh, it's a coral species that is expanding its range um, towards uh, more temperate um, reefs. Just to be clear though, this is not a coral reef, right? Um, um, let me show you what a coral reef looks like. So I've, I brought you back to Wizard Island and this is a photo I took during my PhD um, of the, the same site I showed you before, so trimodal reef. Um, um, so much, much more diverse. And I'm showing you this just to make the point that um, gains and losses don't actually need to balance out and that gains in some places do not necessarily um, um, uh, compensate for losses um, in others. My next example uh, brings you brings us back um, um, on land um, and and focusing on a land use change um, driver and, and particularly uh, forest cover change. And this was work that was led by uh, Gergana Daskalova. And uh, Gergana used not just uh, the biotime uh, database, but also the living planet database. And similarly to the um, example I showed you uh, just before, um, Gergana extracted um, uh, forest cover change time series to match the biodiversity time series that we had in these two databases. And then um, she uh, tested whether or not we could predict one from the other. And, um, and she found some pretty uh, surprising um, results. So this for the living uh, planet uh, database. Um, here um, we are comparing uh, the po population trends um, before and after peak forest loss. Forest loss is not something that just happens once um, uh, in time. It oft often happens multiple times and with different intensities. So uh, for this particular analysis, uh, Gurgana focused on uh, peak forest loss and compared uh, population trends before and after peak forest loss. And what she found was that um, uh, declines in populations became steeper after forest loss, but so did um, increases um, in, in population. And this was not what we had um, um, necessarily anticipated. We tend to associate um, forest loss uh, with, with general declines. Um, in terms of species richness and using the biotime uh, data, what she found was that uh, um, we have sort of steeper declines um, in species richness after uh, forest loss. And although we have um, uh, incre increases in species richness as well, these are not different before and after um, uh, forest um, loss. And so um, what we concluded from this analysis was that both uh, biodiversity and biodiversity, uh, uh, both population and biodiversity change um, uh, increase in intensity after peak forest loss, um, and, and that forest loss acts as a catalyst for, um, for biodiversity um, change. Now, um, I think, I hope I have shown you um, that there is a great deal of variation in biodiversity trends. Um, we see um, variation in trends across scale. We see variation in trends um, across space. Um, we see variation in the intensity of, of drivers of change and even on the effects of those drivers um, on biodiversity trends. Um, and so my fourth and final point is that all of this variation matters. And what's more, there's even more variation that we're not seeing uh, um, that is kind of behind the, um, the metrics that I've focused on um, um, so far. Um, and um, just to give you uh, one example of that, um, the Living Planet uh, Database um, is, is most famous for 
uh, the Living Planet Index, which is released um, uh, every couple of years, um, and which corresponds to um, the geometric mean um, of, pop of, of over 14,000 population trends. And this is, you know, we end up with a pretty striking number when we do these calculations. We, we end up detecting a 50% decline on average. So the, well, geometric mean, and hesitate to say average, <laughs> because that's not, it's not an arithmetic average. Um, uh, but this, the, the thing about the mean is that it, it is abstract, right? It is, it is calculated across lots of different um, 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 trends. And there's many different ways in which we can, we can end up with um, a mean decline of, of, of 50%. Uh, maybe it is because most of the populations within this 14,000 um, have declines around 50%, or it could be uh, that um, this this mean is 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 being um, driven by some ex extreme declines and and other um, less extreme um, uh, uh, declines and so um, in a paper that was led by Brian Long um, that we published last year we saw um, that actually it is the latter see so if we sequentially remove the most extreme declines and recalculate this index what we find is that removing just 2.4, the, the, the 2.4 most extreme declines uh, reverses this trend. So rather than having like this widespread decline everywhere, what we have instead is these very extreme um, uh, declines in some populations, which is a different, a different uh, picture altogether. And what Brian also did in this paper um, uh, was come up with a method that allows us to identify where we have these clusters of extreme um, decline. And, and in doing so, uh, we become better equipped to uh, prioritize our actions. So knowing exactly where um, the problems um, lie. Now, in our analysis of uh, biodiversity, we often, I guess rightly, uh, uh, focus on extinctions. And um, sometimes we focus on colonizations as well, which is the reverse of extinctions at the, at the local scale. But I want to point out that these actually correspond to only 3 and 5% um, of the populations um, in the biotome database. Um, the other 92% um, belong to species that are either always there or that are blipping um, in and out. So there is a lot of, that we miss if we just focus on a lot of change that we miss that if we just focus um, on um, extinctions and colonizations. And this is potentially very important. And among the species that are always there, um, as, well, as well as the ones that blip in and out that, and have multiple extinctions and colonizations, there is a great deal of variation um, in population trends as well, with some uh, species um, increasing in their abundances and others decreasing in their abundance. Clearly, there are both winners as well as losers um, in, in, in the ongoing um, um, massive change that we see in, um, in biodiversity. And the analysis that I'm not showing you here today we actually uh, um, also find that the rates of extinctions or colonizations um, are um, uh, seem to be accelerating, um, which tells us that there is there is a lot going on, um, but but it's but it's in multiple directions and it's complex. So I want to I want to I want to I want to show you now, like I showed you a very sad example. I want to show you um, a winner um, um, as well. And I and I chose to focus on the Iberian lynx because um, when I when I did my undergraduate degree um, uh, uh, back um, like a while ago <laughs> um, at the Universidad de Lisboa, um, we we talked about the Iberian lynx, so um, which is a species endemic to the Iberian Peninsula, Portugal, and Spain, um, as essentially being condemned to extinction. So the, the extremely, extremely rare, um, uh, uh, critically endangered um, um, species. By the time I started my PhD, there were 94 left in the wild. Um, last year, there were 855 left in the wild. Um, and um, although this does not mean that they're safe by any means, there's a lot of work to be done. This is definitely um, a, a good sign. And I think we need to be prepared to celebrate um, these successes in the same way as we mourn 
the losses of biodiversity. So to, um, um, to wrap this up, going back to my original question, is biodiversity declining? Um, I would say that we see clear signs of um, ubiquitous change in biodiversity, but in terms of gains and losses, it's sort of nuanced and, and, and complex. Um, and this nuance matters, um, and it matters for at least two reasons. Um, it matters because understanding these nuances um, allows us to set priorities in terms, um, in, it allows us to understand what is working and what is not. It allows us to understand what needs urgent attention versus what we can maybe put on a back burner. Um, it also matters because it means that we, we can't use we can't really infer what's happening across the entire world from, from biased data. And let me be clear, the data we currently have, the work I presented here comes from, from biased data. So because we have so much variation, we can't really tell what's going on with insects from looking at birds. We can't really tell what's going on in India by looking at England. Um, and um, we, yeah, we, we, we need to do, to have better, um, 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 and less bias um, monitoring um, of, of biodiversity. And I'm, I'm incredibly proud of, of the BioTime um, database. It's, uh, the, the, I spent a lot of the, my past few years um, working with it. Um, it's a public resource, so I hope it's useful to other people um, um, as well. Um, it is also a testament of the kinds of things that we can achieve um, work, you know, by working collectively and by sharing data. Um, and for some places we have lots of data, but also we have a lot of blind spots. We have, you know, for most of Africa, we have very little data. For most of Asia, we have very little data. We have lot, you know, we don't have, we have very, very little data for insects in, the, in, in, in biotime. And, and again, we can't really infer what's happening in one place from what's happening in the other and one taxa from, from the other. From the other. Um, I mentioned at the start the BioTime database is still growing. It's a, it's a, it's a living resource. Um, if you, you want to help me fill these gaps, um, do get in touch. Um, and if you want to use it to um, go explore questions, um, please do so um, as well. And I want to thank everyone whose work um, I presented here, as well as all the funders. And I guess I will take any questions. <laughs> Great. Thanks very much, Maria. Uh, yes, I think we've. Um... Time is getting on, but uh, I would like to take a couple of questions. So thanks for a wonderful talk. Um, let me begin with a question that's come in from um, someone who's remaining anonymous. Um, uh, they say, in your 2014 paper, a lot of the studies look like they came from temperate regions. And now the impacts of land use and climate change are expected to be greater at tropical latitudes. So how do you think the inclusion of more tropical data would uh, change the overall trend line? Oh, that is an excellent question. So I have, you know, I, I have been sort of putting my money on, like, if we have more tropical data, I'm sure that this will shift the, uh, the mean. The, the, the honest answer is, I don't know. I expected it to come out in the, in the, in the geography of biodiversity change uh, paper, and, and it didn't. So we could detect a signal of, um, like we could detect differences between the marine and the terrestrial realm. We couldn't really detect um, uh, differences between tropical versus temperate regions. Um, um, in that there's a there's a great deal of variability in trends in both the tropics um, and the um, uh, um, and, and the temperate regions. But but absolutely, I think getting better representation of the globe is needed so that we can iterative, iteratively get closer to what the true global uh, trends are and, and while not forgetting the variation in distribution. Great, so um, last question then, uh, a brilliant question from Michael Rose, one that um, uh, I might have asked as well. Um, so you've, you've talked really well about the importance of understanding this variation biodiversity change and the various factors uh, that might go into that. But given the title of your talk, how would you answer your own title question to a non-scientist? <laughs> um, that we have systematic change in, um, in biodiversity, um, but that biodiversity um, change is complex. Um, so um, a little bit like 
what we've seen in climate change, just because we are warming on average. So I, I'm not ready to say what's happening on average because of the biases that we have. Um, I, I'm ready to say that there is change pretty much everywhere, changing composition pretty much everywhere and clear signals that something is happening and that maybe this change is accelerating and uh, we shouldn't be complacent about it. Um, um, yes. I know it's not a simple answer, but I'm afraid I just don't have a simple answer to that question. <laughs> yeah. So, um, well, that's fine. It's complicated, but change is happening. We need to know about it and we need to do something about it. Too. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Perfect. What well, a lovely way to end. Thank you very much, um, Maria. Um, so that brings today's Ecology Live to a close. Thanks to Maria again, and thanks to you all uh, for joining the talk online. Uh, Maria has... Uh, agreed to answer further questions on Twitter. Uh, I think her Twitter handle is, is coming up in the chat box. So if your question wasn't answered, uh, do tweet uh, at Maria. Now, next week at our new time of 9 a.m. in the UK, we'll have Hannah Mumby from the University of Hong Kong speaking. Uh, Hannah will talk about incorporating human attitudes and behavior in the ecological research of wild boars in urban environments wild boars in the city uh, so it promises to be very interesting. So if you're watching this on YouTube and want to catch further talks like this, make sure you hit the red subscribe button so you don't miss out. Now we can't say it often enough, we began with this, but don't forget to update your calendars with Ecology Live's new time. Uh, so that's 9 a.m. in the UK, 4 p.m. in Beijing, 6 p.m. in Sydney. Uh, we'll be running at this time for the last three weeks of the series, so we hope you'll be able to join us then. Finally, here's the important details of the offer from our sponsors, um, very generously provided by Oxford University Press. You can use the discount code um, right in front of you on this slide and in the chat to receive an exclusive 30% off uh, the books in their Ecology Live reading list. And that includes uh, this week's book, Conservation Drones, Mapping and Monitoring Biodiversity, uh, chosen for this talk. Uh, so thank you once again. See you next Thursday and goodbye.